name It's something we cannot explain That happens when we proclaim Your great name Your great name We love to yeah. call Your name It's something we, it's something we cannot explain, we cannot explain. That People's Church and welcome to our another service this morning, Church Online, and we would really encourage you to, to subscribe to our YouTube channel or like our Facebook, like our Facebook page and also share it with your friends and families. You never know just how much this will do to someone else and this might be a life-changing thing too in somebody else's life. Those who are joining us for the first time, uh, we would like to hear from you, so please fill in your details. Click the link in the description 
section below or just scan the QR code, fill in your details and we would really love to hear from you and we hope you come back again. Before we go into a time of prayer, I would like to look at this scripture in 2 Kings chapter 19. During this time, this is during the, the reign of King Hezekiah and he and his people are surrounded by the Assyrians making all kinds of threats to them. And what is interesting is after some time, he receives a letter from King Sennacherib. And the Bible says that Hezekiah, and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ears, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Yet the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God, truly, Lord, the kings, the king of Assyria have laid waste to the nation and their, hand, and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all kings of the earth may know that you are you are the Lord God alone. And this is this for me is very interesting that the first thing that he does before he talks about any strategy to counterattack, he takes this letter to the house of God and he just spreads it there. And during these trying times, we we, we probably find ourselves in similar positions where we receive all kinds of reports. Maybe it's about your family member. Maybe it's about you and your health. Maybe it's about your job and your company. All kinds of reports we receive from time to time. And I would encourage you this morning, take that and spread it before God. And it is not a magic trick. It's, 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 it's a way of saying to God, you are plan B. We know of no other plan. No one can rescue, us, can rescue us out of this situation. Hezekiah says, rescue us out of his hands. We know what he has done to ravage other people and their kingdom, laid them to waste. We have no other hope but God. So during this time, I would encourage you as you go into a moment of prayer, just lay whatever you have in your hand, whatever report, just put it before God and say, God, I trust you. Before any other plan, I pray that when I leave this in God's hand, you will take care of it. Let's pray. I Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We lift you up, Lord, because you serve a faithful God. And whatever we have in our hands, Lord, whatever is weighing us down, we would like to commit it into your hands. We thank you so much that you're well able to take care of us because you care for us. We thank you so much that you are able to change situations and circumstances. But we pray that you would change our perspective. Let us see you enthroned. Let us see that you, indeed you are the king of kings. You are the lord of lords. There is no situation above you. Everything, Lord, is beneath you. We lift you up and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The worship team will lead us in a song and after that we'll go into a time of tithes and offering. God bless you. Jesus, you are glorified. You are glorified, oh Father. We just want to worship you. We live to worship you. We live to worship you, oh Father. To worship you.
Good morning once again. My name is Shaka, and I'll be giving you the offering message for today. Now, if you're at home, watching with friends or family, or whoever you may be with, why won't you just turn to someone and just confess and shout and say, I am a giver. Now, before we get into the message, I'd just like to share a short story, or rather a short lesson. It's called, Who Owns Your French Fries? It's about a father and a son who go to the shop. Now the father buys his son a packet or a package of french fries. Well, here we call it chips. And now as they're leaving, the father decides to just have one chip, just for a taste. And as he reaches for that chip, the boy gets furious and angry. And he slaps his dead hand and he says, Hey, hands off my food. Hands off my chips. And now in that moment, the father thinks, My son is selfish. I mean, I believe the father had every right to actually share a portion of those chips with his son. After all, he did pay for it. It does belong to him. The son did not do anything to work or earn the whole package. He did not even pay for it. Yet the father has given him the whole package and he just wanted one. Now, of course, the father could get angry and never buy his son french fries again. Or he could just buy him more. It's up to the father. Now, after all, our father in heaven, he has given us life, talents, money. In fact, he has given us everything that we own. We did not do anything to deserve all that we have. God could have easily given us a bit of talent, a bit of money, a bit of grace, 
a bit of love, a bit of Jesus. But no, he has given us everything. He has given us all. And when God asks, asks us for a portion of what actually belongs to him, we should not be like the kid and figuratively slap God's hand and say, Hey, not my money. Hands off my money. God owns everything that we have. And he wants us to manage it effectively for his glory. Let's manage our time, our talents, and even our money for God's glory. Let's give back a portion of what he has given us. Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. He has given us the blessing to be able to earn, to work, and to accumulate wealth. But we should be faithful in honoring God by joyfully worshipping Him through our giving so that the church can continually, continually do meaningful work for His kingdom. Let's do this with open and cheerful hearts. Let us pray. Father, thank You that You satisfy our every desire and every need. Your Word says that we should honor You and worship You. Thank You that we are able to do this through our giving. Accept our tithes and offerings this morning, Lord. Multiply what we give for the benefit and the effectiveness of your kingdom, Lord. Bless us and bless the offering, Lord, as we faithfully obey your word today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, church. I'm Godfrey Tembo, and I'll be your news reader for today. Let's have a look at what's happening in our church. Good day, church. Christ, our Lord and Savior, led by example. Several times in scriptures, you will read that he went out to pray. So it is also important for us as believers, as his followers, to spend time in prayer. I would like to invite you to join us every Tuesday morning between 5 and 6 as we cry out and lift our voices up to our Heavenly Father between 5 and 6 every Tuesday morning. To be able to join us, please contact me on the number that is flashed on the screen now. Contact me on this number so that I can send you the link so that you are able to join us as we pray together every Tuesday morning between 5 and 6. A praying church is a victorious church. You are furthermore reminded of our, of our Wednesday prayer meeting at 6 o'clock, ending at 7 o'clock. Due to school holidays, the next Friday night you will be on the 15th of October. Game Changers Conference is taking place on the 1st and the 2nd of October hosted by Cornerstone Church in Pretoria. The conference will also be live streamed here at church. Please take a look at the following video for more information. Men of Destiny Conference is happening on Saturday, the 23rd of October, 2021, from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Cornerstone Church. Pastor Odu Rashavambela, as the guest speaker, will be encouraging us around the theme, Take Charge, Part the Waters, from Exodus chapter 14, verse 16. See you there. I've got great news for young adults. Reflect is relaunching on the 5th of October at 6 p.m., if you need more information, send us a WhatsApp message on the number appearing on the screen. Thank you. Now, thank you, Godfrey, for People's News. And during this time, well, we're just about to get into the Word of God. And help me welcome Pastor Mondley as he shares God's Word 
this Sunday morning. God bless you. Good morning, Church at Home family. Uh, it's so good to be back again, you know, preaching God's Word. And I believe that today's message will impact your life. So I'm excited as we're about to go into the Scriptures. But before we go any further, let me just uh, pray for us and let us dedicate this time to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word, that your Word is life, Father, that your Word is light, and your word is a lamp unto our feet, Father God. And we pray that you help us as we are about to go into your word, that we may learn whatever it is that you want us to learn. And we pray that you help us, Father God, to be able to apply it into our lives so that our lives may be transformed. We pray for all this in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen. You know, we live in a world that is very me-focused, don't we? And what I mean by that is that, you know, the world teaches us that we must be at the center of our lives, that we must be always at the center of everything that we do. Think about it. Everything that I do uh, is done from the vantage point of me being at the center. And every decision that I make, you know, is made from that same vantage point of me being at the center of my life. And every experience is measured and judged from the perspective of me being at the center. Alicia Keys once, uh, or recently rather, uh, released a song called Me Times Seven. And the lyrics go like this. They say, me, 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 me. It needs to be about me. And right now there's also a video, I'm not sure if you've seen it, that's currently doing the rounds in the streets of social media where it looks like a pastor is encouraging the congregants that they should focus on their goals Focus on their blessings, focus on their glory, focus on the things that will make their lives better, and focus on their joy. And if you are still not convinced of the fact, I just want you to think of the last three times that maybe you got angry, sad, or cried. And I want you to ask yourself, who was at the center of those moments and experiences in other words, did, uh, did whatever was done, did whatever happened make you angry, sad, or cry because of something that was done to you? Or was it because of something that was done to someone else? And my gut feeling is that the majority of us would say it was because of something that was done or happened to us. Otherwise, why would it affect us so much? You know, we've been so conditioned to view everything through the lens of us being at the center of everything. It is interesting that when we study the Bible, we get presented with an alternative worldview, with an alternative perspective and a way of living, a different way of living our lives. And it is the exact opposite of the me-centered worldview that we have become so accustomed to. And that is the others-centered worldview. The others-centered or the others-focused way of living. And today, it is a very good honor for me to speak under the, the topic, Becoming More Like Jesus. And our primary text for today is found in the letter to the Philippians. In chapter 2, we'll read from verse 5 all the way to verse 11. And this is what it says. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 11. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient, obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
you know, right off the bat, it is good to acknowledge and to note that this was primarily written to people who were already followers of Jesus Christ. But having said that, though, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ today, I would encourage you and even invite you to lean in because what, we are, what I'm about to share is something that I believe can help you to live a life, you know, that leaves a legacy that far outlives you. And so I believe this is something that can benefit you as well. So Paul is writing here, and he gives a command on how we who are believers ought to live. And I mentioned a few weeks ago that Paul uh, took the statement, Jesus is the answer, quite literally. Every answer, uh, every question when it came to Paul, the answer was always Jesus. And here he is encouraging us to take a pattern on how we are supposed to live our lives from the way that Jesus lived his own life when he walked the earth. And we'll begin today by just looking at Jesus as painted by Paul in this passage of Scripture. And so the very first thing that Paul says about Jesus is in verse 6. And he says that Jesus is in the very nature God. But what does that mean? I believe it means that whatever God is, Jesus is. Whatever God is in your mind, in your definition, God is. So Jesus is in the very nature God. Let me also just read what Paul also wrote concerning who Jesus is in another letter that he wrote to the Colossians. I'll read from in chapter 1 from, verses, from verse 15 to verse 20. So Paul says this concerning who Jesus is. And so he says the Son. And here the Son refers to Jesus Christ. He says the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to, to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so Jesus is God in every sense of the word. And so as I mentioned that whatever God is, Jesus is. And yet at the same time, when it came to the matter of making salvation for humanity possible, Jesus did not use any of his rights and, and privileges of him being God to his own advantage. Rather, he humbled himself. This is where Paul says that Jesus took on flesh and blood, that he became a servant, and in appearance he was found as a man, and he died on the cross as a sign of him being obedient to the will of the Father. This was Jesus humbling himself instead of using all his rights and privileges as God to his own advantage. And, it, and two weeks ago, I preached a message on the necessity of the cross. And I would encourage you to go and watch that message if you haven't already, because I believe that it will help you to better understand why Jesus had to die on the cross, why it was necessary for Jesus to be crucified. And so next, Paul uh, says a very interesting thing in verse 9. He says, therefore, or in other words, because of all this, because of all that Jesus did, because of uh, Jesus taking the stance of, of humbling himself, because of all this, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. In other words, God exalted Jesus because Jesus chose to humble himself. In fact, in God's kingdom, humility is the prerequisite to exaltation. Before God exalts a person, there needs to be humility before. You know, one of my all-time favorite songs is actually a song by Hillsong, and it is a song that is called Touch the Sky. The chorus says this. It says, my heart beating, my soul breathing, I found my life when I laid it down, upward falling, 
spirit soaring. I touch the sky when my knees touched the ground. Whenever I, I, I just listen to the song, I, I, I think of a poor man, you know, attempting to put into words what the mind has not or can never fully comprehend. You know, uh, this upward falling, that the way up in the kingdom of God is actually down. Jesus simply said it this way in Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. He says, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In God's kingdom, in God's economy, uh, uh, humility is the prerequisite to being exalted. And so because Jesus greatly humbled himself, God has greatly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, to the effect that there is no other name that is greater than the name of Jesus. There is no other name that is higher than the name of Jesus. And there is no other name that is more popular than the name of Jesus. But perhaps most importantly for us, as Peter says in Acts chapter 4 verse 12, he says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be save, saved other than the name of Jesus. And if you and I are looking for salvation, you know, at this moment, we need to call upon that name, the only name that has been given to mankind that we can call upon for the matters of salvation. And the Bible assures us that whoever calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. And now we circle all the way back to go back to where Paul began, the very first verse in verse uh, in, in, in verse 5. And Paul says, if you and I are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have accepted Jesus into your life and you have made him Lord and King of your life, then we must have this same mindset. And this is more than just a suggestion. This is more than just an opinion. It says we must, we ought to have this same mindset in our life. And that's because being a follower of Jesus means becoming like Jesus. And becoming like Jesus means doing what Jesus did. Listen to how John the Apostle puts it in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. He said this simply. He says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. In other words, whoever claims to be of Christ, whoever claims to have a relationship with God, whoever claims to be a believer or a follower of Jesus Christ, simply must live as Jesus did. This is why this is more than just a suggestion for Paul. This is imperative if you and I are a believer in Jesus Christ. And you and I must emulate the example that our Lord Jesus Christ set for us while he walked the earth. We need to walk the way that he walked. We need to live the way that he lived. Otherwise, we are not really following him. Now, are we? Because if we are following him, we must walk in his footsteps. We must do the things that he did. And so now, what might it look like for you and I to become more like Jesus? I believe, according to this passage, that it would mean living uh, with an others-centered mindset, with an others-focused uh, way of living, that we, that we need to drop, that we need to forsake the me-centered mindset or orientation that this world has hammered into our subconscious. But then we need to begin to adopt an others-centered, an, ad an others-focused mindset or worldview. It means using your rights and privileges for God and for others instead of only using them for yourself. It means humbling yourself and not seeking to exalt yourself. It means making personal sacrifices for the benefit of others. And it means obeying the will of the Father just as Jesus did, even if it costs us greatly personally. And here's the thing that I find most amazing about this whole passage that we have just read. You know, a couple of years prior to this being written and being sent to the Christians in Philippi, 
Paul was on his second missionary journey where he was preaching and spreading the, the message of the gospel to the Gentile world. And he found himself and his company in a leading city in the district of Macedonia. And after having been there a few days, then they started preaching, going out and sharing the message of the gospel to whoever would listen. And we are told that there was a certain young girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination, who followed them wherever they went, followed them proclaiming who they were and why they were there. And it says, after, they, after this went on for many days, Paul got annoyed. Paul got, you know, greatly annoyed. And he rebuked the spirit and he cast the spirit out of the girl. And when her handlers, who were using her to gain profit, when they saw that all their hope for making profit was now gone, they seized Paul and Silas and abused them and, and beat them together with the mob that they had just raised. And then they dragged them to the magistrates, who ordered that their clothes be torn, that they may be beaten with rods. And thereafter, they were thrown into prison. And so we're told that at midnight... While Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns there in the prison, having already been beaten, you know, probably bleeding and wounded, and, and they were singing uh, hymns and, and praying to God, and a miracle took place uh, where all the prison doors flung wide open, and all their chains that they were bound by, they all fell, you know, and, be and came un uh, un unlocked, you know, and unfastened. And then the soldier who was in charge of the prison woke up. Up. And then when he saw what had happened, he assumed that, of course, all the prisoners had escaped, and which was something that would have led to him, you know, being um, killed the very following day as a form of punishment because of his failure. And so having realized this, he drew his sword, wanting to take his own life, lest he should fall, you know, into the hands of, you know, the Roman Empire who would abuse him and and, and kill him because of his failure. And then at that moment, while he's drawing his sword, while he wants to take his own life, we're told that Paul shouted with a loud voice from inside the dungeon, from inside the prison, and he said, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And having heard that, the, 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 this, um, this jailer then asked for some lights, and it was quite dark in there. He asked for some lights, and he went straight into the cell where Paul and Silas were, and he was trembling, and he fell at their feet, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And to cut the long story short, he got wonderfully saved, together with his entire household and his family, and they all got baptized. And this actually took place in the city of Philippi. And that's how the gospel spread to the Philippians, and the church there actually began. And the following day, the magistrate sent a message through the police to the same jailer to say, okay, you can let Paul and Silas go. Let those two men go. It's fine. You know, they are free to leave. And in, verse, in Acts chapter 16, verse 37 to 38, this is what we find. It says, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now uh, throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. Because you see, it was illegal for the magistrates in those days to do to a Roman citizen what they had just done to Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas were, in actual fact, Roman citizens. And so the moral of the story is this, that would the jailer and his whole household had gotten saved, you know, heard the message of the gospel and gotten saved. Had Paul used his rights and privileges as a Roman citizen to save himself from imprisonment? Now, the truth of the matter is that we actually don't know. But this is what we know. That because Paul refused to use his rights and privileges to save himself, but rather laid them down for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of others, the jailer and his entire household got saved. And that was the beginning of the church in that city where, Roman, where, where retired Roman soldiers lived. And the city was called Philippi. And this is the church that started that now Paul writes a letter called Philippians. 
And this is the same Paul now writing to this same ex-Roman soldiers who have now become followers of Jesus Christ. And he's commanding them to follow Jesus' example, even as he himself had done so a couple of years prior. You see, when the world says that it needs to be me first, the gospel and God's kingdom says, no, that is wrong. It is others first. And you may be asking yourself, isn't this way of living more costly and inconvenient? Of course it is. But it is also the only way that God's kingdom gets to spread. It's also the only way that this world gets to be made better and put right again. And now I want you to ask yourself, I want all of us to ask ourselves this. What would it look like for me to live an others-centered life? What rights and privileges do I have because of my identity, because of my race, my social standing, my education, and my connections? And what would it look like for me to lay those rights and privileges down for the sake of others? And Jesus would say, then I want you to go and to do likewise. As I conclude, you may be here and you have never placed your, your faith, you've never placed your life in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never accepted Jesus into your life. And the reality of the matter is that it is the Holy Spirit when He lives within us who gives us the ability and the power to be able to live as Jesus lived. You can try using your own strength. You will definitely make some progress, but you will not be able to have as much impact as God wants you to have. It is the Holy Spirit living within us when we accept Jesus into our lives who gives us the power and the ability to be able to live the way that Jesus lived and the way that God wants us to live. You may be here, you've never done that and you are considering, you're asking yourself, what must I do like that a jailer? What must I do what must I do to receive this salvation to be saved? And the reality of the matter, the truth of the matter is that the Bible says you and I need to believe. You and I need to repent of our sins, which basically means to turn away from the kind of life and lifestyle that we have been living and begin to live the way that God wants us to live. We need to believe in Jesus Christ. We need to believe that He is the one and only Son of God, the only one who was perfect, but who took our place upon that cross and who was uh, punished for our own sins so that we may not get punished for our own sins when we accept him into our lives. And if you are ready to take that step, I will be very honored to lead you in a prayer. And for me, I always say this, that the words of the prayer are not the most important thing. The most important thing is what is happening in your heart. And so you can pray a very simple prayer and you can say, Heavenly Father, or you can say, Jesus, if you exist. If you are out there somewhere, I realize that the way that I have been living is not good and has not helped me. And now I would like to ask you to come into my life, to save me, to make me new, and to make me yours. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And amen. If you prayed that prayer, we would love to hear about it and to celebrate with you. So send us a WhatsApp message to the number that's going to appear at the bottom of the screen. Send us a WhatsApp and we'll also come alongside you, help you, uh, give you things to read to help you get started on this new faith and this new journey of faith. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week and see you again next time.